Okay, so this is going to be a little bit of show and tell. Um, I keep glancing up over there because there's light coming in from that source and I like to brighten. Send a little jolt of light into my optic nerve, into my brain. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I had two poems published in November of 2014. One of them was about 99 lines long and it was called um, uh, Found Music for Two Voices. And this, the other one I had published was about 38, 39 lines long. And it's called uh, Vista Queensboro Plaza 2012. And so I'm going to read the second one to you. I don't, I'm not going to read the first one because it's really for two voices. I conceived it that way and it sounds better that way. I would think I've never heard it that way, but I think it would read well that way. But they were both published in, uh, well, I'll show you the journal. It was no November 2014. And it was this here, um, can you see that? Out of Hour, right. Out of Hour, see that? And it's the final issue. I had the honor of of, of ending the magazine, right? I kill, I shut down the magazine, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, yeah, the final issue, Out of Hour, number 17, uh, from San Francisco, California. Um, so, uh, you know, and I'm gonna say the second one, but there's a little backstory to the second one. Um, I wrote it for a poetry workshop. I had conceived of it in the summer of 2012, uh, and I wrote it, the first draft for a workshop at Poets House, um, and that was um, in March, uh, no, April, late March uh, into April of 2013. Um, uh, one of the reasons I signed up for that workshop, which was a pretty nerve-wracking experience for me to do something like that, was because it was led by Gregory Pardlow, who was a poet I admired very much already. Um, and, and in 2015, which was almost two full years later, right? Yeah, uh, he, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in January of 2015. Um, so I was, you know, privileged to um, meet him and, and, and be in his workshop at Poets House in, in Battery Park City in Manhattan um, in, in um, April of 2013. And a bunch of great, great uh, intellectuals there who were poets. Um, and I read a first draft of this poem, which was subsequently published which I just showed in that journal in November 2014. Um, and I had conceived of it in 2012. This is the first literary quality poem that I know of in America, uh, where the speaker is a submissive man addressing his mistress. I don't know of any kind of, uh, you know, literary quality poem where that's ever been done before in America, or, you know, I can think of Sacro Masek, you know, Venus and Furs, but he wasn't a poet. And in my opinion, Venus and Furs is a pretty mediocre novel. I don't know poetry, I mean, there's a Flanagan, but I think he was not a serious writer. What was his name? Bob Flanagan, who wrote a, a slave sonnets, but I haven't read them. I, you know, um, that's my bad, but I have a feeling he wasn't uh, really a serious literary artist. I mean, anyhow, this is the first one that I think is really, you know, up there. So, um, and so um, I wanted to do that. It, I wanted to create a speaker who's intelligent and dignified and submissive too because you know these the stereotypes of submissive guys are just you know acting you know irresponsibly and, and so I don't want to portray that kind of a image because it doesn't have to be that way um, and it's it's the, the addressee this the, the the addressee in the poem is um, the speaker's mistress her name is Jessica now there's a hypnotist named Jessica Jessica um, from the female what was it the uh, female hypnotist revolution lines FHRA um, she's a hypnotist um, and I had been you know uh, trancing out to her video and I really admired her very much and she's incredible and I don't know what happened to her I never met her never spoke to her but I tranced out to her a lot um, so I wanted to uh, honor Jessica goddess Jessica Jessica she uses the name McKinney or McFinney either one um, uh, I wanted to honor her, the hypnotist, Jessica, um, the bubblegum goddess, as she's known, uh, by making her the addressee of this of this poem. But like I said, you know, um, I've never met her, I've never spoken to her, I don't know her, and we've never been together at Queensborough Plaza, certainly. You know. um, anyhow, uh, that's what this poem is. Um, so it's the first poem that I know of where the speaker is an intelligent and dignified submissive guy addressing his mistress. Okay. I'm going to say it from memory. Hope I don't mess it up. And it went over very well. The first draft went over well in the workshop, and then Gregory said to me, "You need to flesh out the relationship a little more." You know, uh, 
he said it'll be a really strong poem if you just give us more information about the, the relationship we don't you've, I've tried to elide I tried to, in the first draft I tried to elide the nature of the relationship that it was a dom sub relationship and everybody in the group was saying hey you know you just skipped over the relationship you know what are you doing fill it in come on it's right in the middle and you just only gave it one line what are you trying to hide so I, I went back and I wrote the second draft uh, and it was, it's true it was a strong poem it was published okay um, Vista Queensboro Plaza 2012 Manhattan floats in the East River like a lotus in space. Pockets of stagnant river air climb currents to the train platform. It's two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning in the junkyard days, last call for alcohol summer. And Manhattan breathes light through the diaphragm, the serene mind of high civilization contemplating itself. The Chrysler Building's cloudy aureole, the low ambient hum like ohm. An abstracted young man improvises a nocturne on guitar, each tiny note suspended in viscous midair, like a mosquito in amber. I dig in my pocket for a dollar. Then you notice he's not busking. He's playing because he's moved to. I'm moved also, mistress, by the scene, and that you let me read with you tonight in the gold leaf pages of your grimoire. Lucifer is the Latin for light bearer, an ur memory from the inception of self-awareness in our hominid ancestor 130,000 years ago. No other creature can interrogate nature, wonder why do I exist, or scatter its words in an infinite synchronous chat. Now, waiting to catch the end train back to Astoria, we stand at the harvest time of consciousness. These monuments, bridges, impassive skyscrapers frowning down on us, these aloof witnesses, palpable presences, prefigured in archaic ages, in colossal heads and bas-reliefs and stone temples, augured in trance by profane, beatific Gnostics, summoned to a reckoning unseen planets of intelligence, the chromosomal runes and sage syllables that plot the periodic advent of world saviors and keep the fleshy lantern lit for magi like us, Jessica, who brandish nothing in this world but hallows and require nothing of the gods but this. Okay. Okay, so Britney Spears is going to be on TV tonight on the VMA. I hope I can get it on my cable TV. I don't know if it's going to be on, but I'm going to look around for it. I call her Goddess Britney. <laughs> and uh, you might notice the similarity to the, the video from uh, the end of the video from uh, Britney and Iggy. <laughs> this was out first, I should say. <laughs> um, the Pretty Girls video, right? Okay, so. So I'll try to get Brittany out. I call her Goddess Brittany because she's so perfect and beautiful. And Goddess Christina Aguilera too. <laughs> Those Disney girls are crazy, man. <laughs> Keep them coming, Disney. <laughs> Oops, am I allowed to say that word? <laughs> all right. And, and most of all, Goddess Jessica. Uh, uh, come, Goddess Jessica. Come. We need you. All right. Bye.